today I'm glad to welcome you to History by Lou. And today's topic is going to be another part of the early industrial revolution of the United States, the antebellum period. While you listen to this, I want you to ask yourself three fundamental questions. First of all, why did most of it take place in New England? Secondly, the emergence of Southern wealth and slavery. What is the connection? And finally, was the treatment of workers in the North essentially another form of slavery? Well, as you listen to this, ask yourself those questions and others. So let's get on with the presentation. We begin our exploration of the second part of my look at the Industrial Revolution in the United States, which made such a huge difference in all of our lives, even today. So what happened during this period before the Civil War between 18... 100 roughly in 1860. First of all, North and South diverged dramatically economically. The North became the industrial powerhouse. Meanwhile, the South focused on agriculture. But in the background, slavery was a source of conflict that would only increase as the decades of the early 19th century unfolded. The Industrial Revolution ignited the northern economy and brought about a complete revolution in domestic life and social manners. In the northern states, innovation and personal freedom encouraged resourcefulness and experimentation. An atmosphere favorable to business growth encouraged the invention of new techniques. A chronic worker shortage, however, led to the development, first of all, of labor-saving machinery, and secondly, the employment of women in the early factories. The economy of the northern states depended on Yankee ingenuity and inventiveness that contributed to this massive growth of the economy. Economic expansion created a huge demand for labor that was filled, in part, by European immigration. Major inventions and innovations during the Industrial Revolution included things like canals and railroads and telegraphs and sewing machines and steamboats and many, many others. Transportation and communication revolutions changed the way business was done and made transactions faster. U.S. clipper ships that were sailing around the world set speed records and captured markets until they, too, were replaced by steam-driven iron vessels in the mid-19th century. Financial and insurance industries developed to serve the new industrial corporations, and American exports climbed as the demand for U.S. raw materials increased overseas. Yankee ingenuity, resourcefulness, and experimentation led to the creation of whole new industries, a Yankee, by the way, is someone who lives in the northern states, especially in New England. The number of patents issued by the U.S. Patent Office dramatically increased, from only 41 in 1800 to 4,357 in 1860, and that was only the beginning of the latter part of the 19th century. It explodes even more. We have this stereotypical view of the South with this plantation house and thought, well, we think maybe that's all there was to it. Well, the South was an economy built on agriculture and slavery, but they didn't all live in houses like that. Here, by the way, is a photo of an actual slave auction, human beings being treated as property, bought and sold. Hard to imagine today, but that was the case. But the society was not what we stereotypically think of. The Southern society, first of all, those who had large slave plantations were only or less than 1% of the white families. 50% or more slaves over a million acres or thousand acres, I'm sorry, in property. Then we have mid-sized slave plantation owners, 3% of the white families. They had between 20 and 49 slaves and over 100 acres and they were became politically the most powerful group in the South. They were the small slaveholders, 20% of the white families, 1 to 19 slaves, mostly farmers, and a smaller urban middle class. Now, if you add those up, 20 plus 3 plus 1, you're only at 24% who even had one slave. Then there were non-slave-owning whites. They were 75% of the white families. Yeoman farmers and tenant farmers and some urban workers. 
There were some free blacks, 6% of the blacks. Legal and social restrictions limited their opportunities, so they weren't really free either. They couldn't do everything they wanted to do. And of course, then there were slaves. By 1860, one third of the South's population were slaves. And the majority worked on these large plantations. What part of the nation had the most manufacturing establishments? Well, you can see it was New England. And then there were some out in St. Louis and also some in California. What's unusual about California's rank, considering its geographical location in 1860, the reason that they were so, uh, so much industry was taking place there is they did it out of necessity. They couldn't always wait to import something all the way from the East Coast. And so they had to develop their own manufacturing and they in, were ingenious and invented things themselves. The factory system, we're gonna define it. We're gonna talk about bit new business organizations, about our friends Francis Cabot Lowell and the Boston Associates, about factory workers, the Lowell strike, and early attempts at unionization, and a struggle for a 10-hour workday. You would think that would have been so remote that you wouldn't imagine. You would, in those days, even 10-hour day would have been a breakthrough. Factory system defined, it was a new way of organizing paid workers at a central location to make goods in an efficient manner. Before the factory system, most production was done in homes or small workshops. The development of large, complex, expensive machines required the workers to come to the machines to work, unlike previously when all of this was done in their homes. Now they did it in big factories. Factories displaced traditional artisans. Here we see some examples of working from home prior to the factory system. The factories that were developed were large, dirty, miserable facilities uh, with no concern at all for individual workers' welfare. New business organizations emerged, emerged during this time, and this was the rise of the corporate model for business. It was something new. There had always been sole proprietorships. These were easy to start. One person starting them gets the profits or losses individually. The liability of the owners, they could lose all their assets. They're hard, it's hard to raise money, and they can't sell stock. Then there are partnerships. Easy to start. The partners invest in the business and share the profits or losses. Again, there's liability. The owners can lose all their assets. It's hard to raise money and they can't sell stock. Now comes this new organization called a corporation. And a corporation is harder to start. It is a legal entity with separate legal personality from its members. And the members cannot lose their assets. They can raise money by selling stock. The value of the stock can go down but the individual person who invests will not lose their uh, money because they are an investor. Corporations could raise money by selling shares or stock, and the investors bought the shares hoping their value would rise, and that often they did. Here's a, an example from the Stanislaus Central Bridge Company, and one of the things that's true of all of the stock certificates is they were very ornate. Corporations are considered gifts of a government to private businesses. Corporations are granted perpetual life. They never can disappear unless you uh, go through bankruptcy or some action to close them. Diversified ownership, limited liability for debts to shareholders. After the Dartmouth College versus Woodward Supreme Court decisions in 1819, corporations became the most important type of business organization in the U.S. And they still exist, and they're still the most important today. In 1814, the wealthy and socially prominent Francis Cabot Lowell and several friends established the Boston Manufacturing Company, also called the Boston Associates. They were going to invest their family shipping fortunes in a new business. Their capital investment was $400,000, the equivalent of $1.75 million today, at that time, it was the largest amount ever invested in manufacturing. Their first factory in Waltham, Massachusetts, was the first in which all machines were driven by water power. For the first time, the power loom and other machinery permitted the steps of cloth production to be carried out under a single roof. In 1822, the company bought land for expansion and named the new town Lowell, after their partner who had died in 1817. Here is a depiction of 
what a, a, this looked like during that time. The Boston Associates, the first investment company in America, it had over 80 members, all of whom were related. They established 31 textile companies in New England, and they produced their textiles using materials from the southern states. They named their business the Merrimack Manufacturing Company. They invested their profits in railroads, banks, and insurance companies. They were the biggest employers in New England, with many thousands of workers. By 1850, the Boston Associates controlled 20% of the cotton production in the United States. And, of course... The cotton manufacturers and counties were all in pretty much in northeastern United States, and in particular, they are in Massachusetts. The textile factories, as I said, were big, massive things with a lot of whirling machines and belts and so forth. They were, they were very, very unsafe places to work. They were canals and factory towns in 1827. Everything was booming. New class developed, factory workers. Thomas Jefferson warned his fellow Americans of the dangers of industrialized society. He hoped the U.S. could remain an agricultural-based society. He had an agrarian vision of America, and he saw industrialized America as a nightmare. The new factories disrupted the traditional artisan labor system and eventually replaced it almost entirely. Traditionally, most manufacturing was done by craftsmen working in their homes or small shops, and they made their products and they sold them. The artisan system had developed three classes of workers, masters, journeymen, and apprentices. The master craftsman was self-employed, a master craftsman who owned their own business. The skilled journeymen worked for the master craftsman but owned their own tools. They hoped to save enough money to set up their own business someday, and then there were apprentices, usually young boys and teenagers who worked for a master, while learning a trade or a craft, and then they hoped to become skilled journeymen and later master craftsmen on their own. The artisan system broke down as small shops were replaced by factories using unskilled laborers. The paternalistic, in other words, treating workers in a fatherly manner, attitude typical of the artisan system gave way to the view that workers were commodities, just like labor, lumber, other iron or cotton. In this view, workers were easily fired or replaced with cheaper laborers, and the boss or owner had no responsibility for their welfare. It was an immoral system in that sense. And there were a lot of artisans who were blacksmiths and shoemakers and tin workers who were displaced. In the early factories, women and children were employed. As a matter of fact, more than half were under 18 years of age. And so you'll ask, why? Why? Well, cheaper wages, easier to control, and the smaller size of women and children. See, now they didn't need actual physical power because so the many families with the men, uh, had they clung to the artisan work while the women and children went to work in the factories. The early mills were small, dot, hot rather, damp, dusty, and unhealthy. There were no, they were, they were miserable places. 12, 13, and even 14 hours a day were not unusual. The average work day was 11 hours per day. 13 hours per day of close attention and monotonous labor are extracted from many young women in these manufacturers. They would be so fatigued that they would simply come home, eat quickly, and collapse into bed and get up and renew the whole thing the next day. Growth in manufacturing and jobs, including textile industries, was phenomenal. It went from virtually none in 1820 to almost a million and a half by 18. The whole population of the country, by the way, was only about four million at that point. Uh, here's an 1836 song lyric sung by protesting workers at Lowell. Oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die? Oh, I cannot be a slave, I will not be a slave, for I am so fond of liberty that I cannot be a slave. But she was. They were slaves. They were white slaves, uh, and they lived pretty miserable lives without much future. Short lives, actually. Deaths came at a younger age in those days. In 1840, the majority of cotton spindles, the machines used in cotton factories, were in the northeastern states. 
Urban factory work was a major occupation of the native-born migrants from the countryside as well as the immigrants. So you had both happening. You had people giving up their farm work, living on the farm, and moving into the cities to work in factories, but you had a large flood of immigrants coming from Europe mostly. 64% of Boston's female industrial workforce was immigrant in 1860. Women workers performed the same unskilled jobs in urban mills as the rural mills, and they were paid much less than men who often performed skilled jobs. In Philadelphia in the 1830s, mill women made an average of $2.25 per week, but compared to men's average weekly earnings of $6.50 to $7 a week. Can you imagine that? And so, the people in order to, they aspired to a better life. And so there actually was a literary magazine put out by Lowell women in the early years where they were trying to uh, help themselves to grow into a better life. And eventually as the years would pass, they would. When you worked in the bells, you, you were subject to bells, bells to start, bells to go to lunch, bells to come home from in from lunch, bells at the end of your work shift, uh, Everything was run by bells in these factories. There were many textile samples that were developed during this time because they became very creative in how they used all these machines to create an incredible array of new styles and patterns and textures that had never been seen before. So one letter from a young girl by the name of Mary S. Powell said this in one place. Uh, she says, last Thursday, one girl fell down and broke her neck, which caused instant death. She was going in or coming out of the mill and fell down it, being very icy, and nobody cared. And then another thing she says, at half past six the, six, the bell rings for the girls to get up, and at seven, they are called to the mill. At half past twelve, we have dinner and are called back again at one and stay until half past seven. So she works hard, long, long hours. She furthermore goes on to say in another letter that the wages are going to be reduced by 20, per 20th, by the 20th of this month. And she said, I expect to be paid about $2, about $78 in 2024 dollars. Male workers at that time made $170 a week on average, uh, a week, but it will be dearly, dearly earned. Job dissatisfaction actually led to a strike in Lowell in 1836 after the announcement of a wage cut. The workers decided to strike, shutting down the mills. The mostly female crew assembled and listened to speeches from early labor reformers. One of the girls declared that it was their duty to resist all attempts at lowering their wages. This was the first time a woman had spoken in perfect public rather in Lowell and the event caused surprise and consternation among her audience. Women just didn't do that in that period of time. Besides the wage decrease, the corporations announced that the cost of room and board would now have to be paid solely by the workers. This, in addition to the cut in wages, would make a difference of at least $1 a week. Or in other words, in 2024 dollars, that would have been a cut of $33 a big change. Unions began to form after the Revolutionary War in cities such as Philadelphia and Baltimore. In the 1820s, the Mechanics Union of Trade Associations, the first to combine different types of unions, formed in Philadelphia. Its goals were not only higher wages and improved working conditions, but also free public schools, abolition of a debtor's jail, and universal male suffrage. The union entered politics to secure its goals. Up until the mid-19th century, a person could be put in jail if he or she could not pay back money owed. Early unions pushed to have debtors' jails abolished. Child labor was widespread in the 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, in New England, about 30% of the workers were children under 16. 30% of the workers were children under 16. And these debtors' prisons were terrible because... If you got thrown in debtor's prison, you couldn't work to pay off your debt to get out of prison. And so you were in a very difficult box that you couldn't get out of. Uh, debtor's prisons have, of course, been abolished. Thank God.
In the late 1820s, unions entered politics with the Working Men's Party. It was made up of craftsmen, skilled journeymen, and reformers who sought a 10-hour workday, free public education, abolition of debtor imprisonment, and an end to prison contract labor. The party ended in the 1830s, and several New York members joined the local focal party, a radical faction of the New York State Democratic Party. Many of the early labor unions were destroyed by the economic collapse caused by the Panic of 1837. Nearly 30% of U.S. workers lost their jobs in that depression, the Panic of 1837. Labor unions made a comeback in the 1840s and 50s, but again devastated by the economic crisis of the Panic of 1857. Unions came back after the Civil War, but would not become a major factor until the late 19th century. And remember, there were no, there were no safety nets. There wasn't any workers' compensation. There wasn't any health care provided. And so if you lost your job, you were really, really suffering. Jobs during this time were people like firemen and carpenters and coopers, and a new job, a daguerreotypist that emerged because of the new printing technology. Major antebellum labor, labor accomplishments. Remember, antebellum, ante means before, and bellum means war, so these are the pre-war accomplishments. In 1840, President Van Buren established a 10-hour workday for all federal employees. In 1842, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled in Commonwealth versus Hunt that labor unions were not illegal conspiracy. 1842, children were prohibited from working over 10 hours a day. In 1847, New Hampshire made 10 hours the legal workday. In 1848, Pennsylvania passed a law to make 12 the minimum age for child workers. In 1848, Pennsylvania passed a 10-hour workday. And the workers who are doing jobs like latchmakers and machinists and watchmakers and door-to-door -door peddlers, too, that existed in this time. The use of steam and water-powered machinery led to a factory system similar to England's with great riches for the owners and grinding poverty for the workers. A series of strikes broke out in the early 1790s, and the goals of striking workers were primarily higher wages and a shorter, for them shorter, meant a 10-hour workday. Shoemakers in Philadelphia formed a short-lived craft union in 1792. Printers in New York carried out the first strike in 1794. Other strikes soon followed in Philadelphia where cabinet members, carpenters, and codwainers, that's leather workers, struck for improved working conditions. Several unions and labor organizations were convicted of conspiracy and injury to trade by hostile judges. Jobs during this time would have included things like being a seamstress, a servant nanny, sometimes a salesman, even a stonecutter. One of the major goals of antebellum unions was a 10-hour working day. The average working day ranged from a low of 10 hours to a high of 16 hours a day. In 1791, Philadelphia carpenters went on strike for a 10-hour day. Various worker organizations, male and female, fought for the 10-hour workday. The union's struggle for a shorter workday had some success when, in 1842, Van Buren declared a 10-hour workday for all federal employees. New Hampshire and Pennsylvania passed legislation making 10 hours the legal workday in the late 1840s, and then after the Civil War, the eight-hour day became the new goal of organized labor. So what were the major effects of the Industrial Revolution? Well, first of all, there was significant population growth. The United States was expanding dramatically. There was new manufacturing technology, new inventiveness. There were improvements in transportation. This is when we had the advent of the canals and the railroads and so forth, and the clipper ships. There were new types of business organizations, such as the corporation. And America began to move west in large numbers to populate the Great Plains. There was urbanization. People were leaving the farms and moving to the cities. And there was a market revolution during this period. It was a significant time of major change in our country. And it provided decades of progress that have defined and would continue to define what America would become as a nation. And so, remember to hit the subscribe and like buttons so I can be encouraged to create more History by Lou just for you. 
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed and learned today.